All right, hi everybody. We're group two consisting of Melody, Nayoon, Ethan, and Julie. And today we're gonna to be presenting paper 12, SR3 image super resolution via iterative refinement. So some information about this paper, it was published back in June, 2021, which in the field of computer vision is already considered pretty old. But as you can see from the number of references and citations, it was a pretty foundational paper in the area of super resolution. So what exactly is super resolution? To put it simply, it's taking a low resolution input image and then generating new pixels based on the content of that image to increase the resolution of that image. So some of the early work on super resolution was largely regression based. Uh, this just simply learned a mapping function from the low resolution input to the high resolution output. And this algorithmic approach was good. We were able to increase the resolution of it, but as you could see, it more or less just took an average of the pixels and we didn't gain any new information from the new pixels that we got, even though it was larger. So as opposed to this, the authors of this paper decided to apply diffusion to super resolution by treating it as a conditional image generation task. This means that instead of conditioning it on the input label like we've seen, they instead condition it on a low resolution input image. Specifically, the authors modified the unit architecture as it's well suited for varying scales of resolution, which is required for a task such as super resolution. So here you could see a low resolution input image. And if we put it through the SR3 process, we could see just how closely it's able to match with the ground truth. And when we compare it to regression-based methods, we see that all the detail that we lost in regression, we're able to gain in SR3. So the whiskers we are able to get and the pupils you can see, whereas all that information is blurred out in the regression-based approach. So some of the work that came in between regression and SR3 includes autoregressive models, but these are computationally expensive and can only reach a limited resolution, as well as variational autoencoders, but these suffered from suboptimal sample quality. And we've seen recently the popularity of GAN models, but these are difficult to optimize and often require auxiliary functions to keep consistency between the input and the output. In addition, this paper also inspired some future work already that's already been done. We actually saw it in this class two weeks ago when they presented paper 10. So the authors of this paper realized that they could take SR3 and rather than conditioning on a low resolution input, they can first start with pure Gaussian noise. And from there, they can use a simple diffusion model to generate that initial low resolution image. We can then take that image and chain SR3 models until we reach our desired output resolution of a completely new face. So here you can see the uh, timeline for some of the different image synthesis models. So like I said, started with SR3 and the section in this paper uh, inspired the authors to go on to write cascaded diffusion models. And they iterated on these a few times, uh, but actually more recently towards the end of 2021, uh, we saw a trend in the use of latent models to reduce the computational complexity uh, since they work in the latent space and don't have to operate on uh, pixel-based as with earlier approaches. So the main contributions of SR3 included the use of iterative refinement steps to greatly reduce the computational complexity while still producing great high quality images, as well as the denoising score matching, which kept consistency between the input and output images, and the modified UNET residual block, which we'll expand on more in the section about the architecture. And as we discussed, it was the inspiration for using diffusion for unconditional image synthesis. So all of this put together resulted in SR3, which is able to generate high quality outputs, uh, higher quality outputs than prior methods, while not increasing the computational complexity greatly. Uh, now we'll move on to Nayun to dive a little bit deeper into the architecture behind SR3. Okay, so let me explain how the SR3 generates the uh, one super resolution image. And this is the example task for generating 120 A resolutions from this 16 input image. And to condition the model on this input image, the low resolution image is upsampled to the target resolution image. And for the upsampling, they use the bicubic interpolations. So before the image enters to the refinement step, the input image is upsampled to the 120 resolution in this case. And then the result is concatenated with the noise data with YT along the channel dimensions. And for the concatenation, they tried a sophisticated method such as film, 
but they have found using simple concatenation generate the similar qualities. And then the image enters the modified unit architecture and iterates the diffusion processing and the denoising processing until you get the target resolution image. So after the inference, we can get the final high resolution image. And I will explain about the architecture of the SR3. So as Ethan mentioned before, uh, SR3 used the unit architecture, uh, but with some modifications based on the DDPM approach. And the first modification was they replaced these residual blocks with the blocks in the began, and I will explain in detail at the next slide. And because of this replacement, they rescaled the skip connections by one over the root square of two. And because, because of this replacement, they need to stabilize the network. And this is the detailed structure of the residual blocks. And once again, they replace the standard blocks with those in the BGAM. And the BGAM is another generative model uh, based on the modified version of the GAN architectures. And they have two kinds of residual blocks, the G block and the D block. But in this case, they used uh, this G block. And because G block has additional convolutional and the normalization, normalization layers, so this results in the larger capacity than the standard blocks. So it can generate more detail than the fine textures. And also, uh, this block have multi-scale features, so they can have 256 feature maps, and they use the spatial attentions so they can selectively focus on the different part of the images during the generation process. And this block is, uh, is designed to conditioning on, on the additional inputs, such as noise vectors and class labels. So it helps to generate more diverse and high quality images. And for the training, they, uh, the authors, they follow the noise scheduling that based on the wave grid. And this is the speech waveform generation models. And the purpose of this noise scheduling is adding the noise during the training process in a scheduled manner to balance the trade-off between, uh, between the generating high quality output and avoiding the overfitting. So as shown in, in the wave grid, uh, we can see the amount of the noise gradually decreases over the time. And over the time during the training process, as the model converges on the optimal solutions. And this, this research has confirmed that using the same noise schedules uh, then used on the training, it can also be used for the inference and it shows the best performance. And it means that they don't need to uh, train the individual models for hyperparameter searchings. So uh, in SR3, they they follow to follow this noise scheduling, they use these piecewise distributions and it divides the training process into several intervals and assigning the noise distribution to each step. And to get this distribution, uh, the time step T is uniformly sampled. And in this paper, they set the T as 2000. And once T is determined, the noise is uniformly sampled according to these intervals. So using this noise scheduling, SR3 can choose the best noise schedule at the training and they can use the same one at the, for the inference. And because this process is involved in the training once, so there is no need to train the model over multiple times. So this benefits made SR3 is a cost-effective and efficient solutions. Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. So with this structure and the noise scheduling, SR3 showed the best, uh, showed improved performance compared to the prior works. And one of them is its efficient inference speeds. Because this model set the maximum inference to 100 to the diffusion steps and the hyperparameter searching. But the prior works, they required one or 2K diffusion steps for the inference. 
And the another key difference is this model conditions on the noise directly, but the prior works they conditions on the time step t. So by conditioning on the noise directly, uh, it is more flexible for choosing the hyperparameters during the inference. And SR3 trained the model once. So with this strength, SR3 is outperformed the previous low resolution frameworks. And now I will transition to Julie. She will talk about the detailed algorithm. Okay, thank you, Nayeon. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, how do I get my pointer? Oh, oh. Okay, cool. I'm going to go over the forward noising process for SR3. This is the part where we have a high resolution image and we gradually uh, add the noise distribution to destroy the signal in that image. So as input, we're going to begin with uh, X, which is a low resolution, a small image that we uh, by cubing interpolate up to the target resolution um, that, um, that Y is. And then we concatenate it channel wise so it can serve as conditioning input in our uh, unit architecture. Um, the forward noising process is a Markov chain of learned transitions of uh, noisy latents. Um, so this is the not noisy Y0. And we're going to learn these noisy uh, intermediate latents from Y1 to Yt uh, iterations. The amount of noise that we introduce at each iteration depends on this uh, noise uh, variance schedule term alpha. Um, so given the forward uh, Markov chain and then the intermediate um, uh, latent steps, we can marginalize out an intermediate step and directly compute the latent at Y at arbitrary time step T. Um, so given Y0, the not noisy target resolution image, we can directly find the noised version of it at T by um, doing the cumulative product of the uh, variance term gamma. So in backward denoising, we're going to begin at yt, which is a uh, noise, and we're going to use the data distribution to recover um, some sample from the data distribution. But uh, we have to condition on x that low resolution input, and the output has to be consistent with that low resolution input. So we have to optimize the denoising uh, model. So given that source input image uh, x, the low resolution image, and then we receive a noisy target resolution image, and this noisy target is comparable with that uh, forward diffusion uh, latent uh, definition. Um, and we get gamma, that noise variance term. We're going to give our neural denoising model this information and it's going to predict the noise vector and then hopefully yield the noiseless target uh, resolution sample. This is our objective function for training. The expected data, the expected noise, this is our denoising model with X, a noisy target and the variance. We're going to minus uh, epsilon, the noise, and we're going to try to minimize this expected uh, loss. Algorithm one, training a denoising model, repeat sample data from the uh, training data set. Uh, variance, uh, the variance is as Nayon, des uh, Nayon described, it's a piecewise distribution, uniformly sample the time step, uniformly sample from the variance distribution. And then epsilon is gonna be some uh, normally distributed noise. And we take a gradient descent step towards converging um, this expected loss. Now we're going to iteratively in, infer. So given that X low resolution input and uh, Y uh, T, uh, the noise uh, at target resolution, we're gonna use that data distribution and gradually recover signal that's consistent with the input X. So the reverse chain um, is going to be uh, inferring given uh, the uh, low resolution input and the target resolution, we're going to go back the steps um, until we recover that noiseless target. And we're going to begin at YT, which is approximately pure Gaussian noise, um, approximately because we still are conditioned on that low resolution uh, input image, which is not pure noise. 
the reverse distributions are going to be based on um, a mean and a standard deviation. Um, and the reverse uh, inference is learned isotropic conditional distributions. When the variance is small enough, um, it's sufficient that the reverse chain is also uh, Gaussian conditional distributions. And isotropic means that the probability density is equal in all directions. So to make that tractable, we're going to use this scalar uh, standard deviation term, which is just the uh, variance squared times identity matrix. So our denoising model is trained to give us a noiseless target. We're going to get a denoised estimate um, beginning with that uh, noisy uh, target resolution image. We're going to get a denoised version of it. We're going to use that to parameterize the mean of the next inference. So this is the mean, and we're going to use that mean in our inference iteration. And this is the default uh, variance that we learned in the forward process, the best uh, noise schedule to use. We're going to use that again in our inference. And uh, a key contribution from the authors was that score matching uh, um, contribution because uh, each inference step resembles Langevin dynamics, which is a gradient-based sampler. So um, in the real world, data is usually uh, located in low-dimensional manifolds um, um, in high-dimensional spaces. Uh, so the gradients are not well-defined, and um, it's very hard to go from these sparse regions. Um, they're very isolated, so it's hard to find and converge on the data. Um, so we want to add some noise to increase the dimensional coverage and make the gradients more well-defined, um, pointing in the direction of the data density. So uh, that variance schedule um, and the epsilon is going to be that noise perturbation that we need um, to use on the data. And then our denoising model uh, learns the gradient of the data log density. So this resembles the denoising score matching, and um, it needs the support of the diffusion uh, model's noise distribution uh, in order to learn the gradients. So algorithm two, inference and t-iterative refinement steps. Uh, Y t begins at approximately Gaussian noise. For t iterations, sample some normally distributed noise. Z is here, normally distributed noise. And then for the next inference step, uh, get the mean from the denoising model, get this estimate, and then add some noise with the variance schedule. And then end the loop after t iterations and return the recovered uh, denoise estimate. Next, uh, Melody is going to go over super resolution examples. All right. Thank you, Julie. So um, SR3 is successful on a couple different categories and experiments. We've uh, The authors do a couple things, uh, experimenting with cascaded image synthesis, as well as face super resolution and natural image super resolution. Um, with cascaded image synthesis, we see that they do two main tasks, first being a 16 times magnification and then a four times magnification. Um, with face super resolution, they do two tasks of eight times magnification. And then with natural image super resolution, we see a task of four times magnification. Um, specifically looking at cascaded high resolution image synthesis, um, this paper uh, brought light to some initial testing of cascading SR3 models for this purpose. After this paper was published, the same authors came out with the CDM paper for high fidelity image generation. Um, and the authors first studied cascaded image generation, however, by cascading SR3 models. So the idea of image uh, synthesis here was done through the sequential uh, sequential SR3 models being chained together. Chaining together smaller models allowed for um, efficient parallel training that requires fewer parameters and easier computation overall. And with more refinement steps at lower resolutions and fewer at higher, this enabled efficient performance. Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. So 
when testing cascaded image generation with SR3, the authors looked first with face generation. The cascade consisted of three models, the first being an unconditional DDPM, the second being that first SR3 model um, going from 64 by 64 to 256 by 256. And then finally, we end with our second SR3 model um, upscaling up to 1024 by 1024. This looks something like this, where we start with our unconditional DDPM, training that and generating our first 64 by 64 image. This image is then used as input for our first model or the second model in this cascade. Um, this image, this uh, model here outputs our um, target resolution in, uh, from this model as 256 by 256 uh, output image. And then from here, we feed this into our third model or our second SR3 model, giving us our final target resolution of a high depth one, uh, 1024 by 1024 image. Um, this process allows for uh, outputs that are high and high fidelity, as well as diverse in expression, age, um, gender, among other things. Um, in terms of uh, synthetic natural image generation, um, they also tested this using a cascade of two different models, the first being a class conditional improved DDPM, and the second being our super resolution model uh, upsampling to 256 by 256. This looks similar to the last process. Uh, first, a class conditional DDPM, DDPM model is fed a random label. Uh, they generate a 64 by 64 sample, which is then fed into our SR3 model and then outputs our final output resolution of 256 by 256. This again produces high fidelity output um, that is competitive with other super resolution techniques. Um, in terms of data sets, we see that for training, they use the Flickr Faces HQ data set consisting of 70,000 images, and they evaluate on the Celeb HQ data set consisting of 30,000 images. Um, in terms of natural image and natural image synthesis, they use the ImageNet data set, um, specifically ImageNet 1K, consisting of over a million photos of a thousand different object classes. So here's a summary of the training details used for both the baseline regression model trained here, as well as SR3. Both uh, are trained with a million training steps with a batch size of 256. Um, in terms of checkpoints, the regression baseline model is based on the peak PSNR metric, while, whereas SR3 is based on its latest checkpoint. Um, they use an atom optimizer, as well as these learning rates for both the regression and SR3. Um, in terms of qualitative results, we first see an example here of this uh, face super resolution task going from 16 by 16 to 128 by 128. We see our input noisy image here, our SR3 output, and the ground truth to compare. We see that SR3 is able to generate um, an image that is pretty consistent with the ground truth and consistent in terms of the hair, facial features, and the overall structure, as well as um, giving us an image that is high fidelity. We see some inconsistencies, however, with the uh, subject's collar. This is pretty typical among super resolution techniques as the uh, model is training on structure and trying to improve structure and, and maintain consistency between these two images rather than maintaining this specific texture here as seen in the collar. Another example here is um, super resolution for natural images using ImageNet. Um, we see again our input image an SR3 output and the ground truth. Um, again, the SR3 model is able to output um, a high resolution image that is similar and consistent with the ground truth. Um, here we take a look at a couple uh, comparisons between our baseline regression model and SR3. We have the ground truth image here of this leopard, as well as the bicubic interpolation image that is fed into the model in the beginning. Uh, between the regression and SR3 model, we see that regression provides results that are pretty consistent with the ground truth. However, when you do zoom in and look at, at a patch of um, the image, we see that the results are blurred as Ethan was describing earlier. Um, however, SR3 is able to generate a reconstructed image that is similar in structure and detail. We see things like this leopard spots um, maintaining the quantity of spots on this leopard, whereas uh, regression is pretty blurred in we see um, less spots in detail. 
In terms of performance comparisons and metrics, we uh, look at FID, IS, PSNR, and SSIM. Here is a table showing the results of a four times magnification task on ImageNet. Um, we see that SR3 is outperforming regression in terms of FID and IS, showing that SR3 pr uh, provides high fidelity and high uh, quality samples. In terms of PSNR and SSIM, regression tends to outperform, and uh, we see it's outperforming here versus SR3. Um, this is generally because uh, these metrics prefer uh, regression-based techniques. They penalize synthetic high-frequency detail that is not perfectly aligned with an input image. For example, looking back at this image of the leopard, um, matching the spots on the leopard, or matching strands of hair on a human subject. For this reason, the paper goes into a little bit why how the metrics are not the most representative of human evaluation. So now looking at human evaluation specifically, the authors uh, conduct a couple of tasks in grading. They first ask the question of, given uh, these three images, which of the two larger images is a better high quality version of the low resolution image in the middle? The second question is, which image out of these two image, images would you guess is from a camera? So uh, to measure those evaluations, they use full rates, which are a fraction of trials where the evaluator selects model output over the ground truth. Um, taking a look specifically at face full rates first, we see that for task one, where they give the human evaluator these three images, SR3 outperforms um, with a 54.1% full rate compared to other techniques in which a human evaluator is choosing SR3 over, in this case, pulse. So it's, it's outperforming our regression baseline as well as previous uh, super resolution techniques. For task two, we see also similar results, um, giving us a 47.4% full rate where um, human evaluators are choosing again, SR3 over pulse. Um, in terms of natural image full rates, we see similar results again, um, SR3 is outperforming regression, giving us a score that is almost double that, or actually over double that of our regression score. And then again, for task two, similar results. I'm gonna now pass it on to Nayon. She's going to be describing our demo. Okay, so we found that on the Fisher SR3, is implemented at the GitHub so we could learn some demos. So as this in this example, we can see the detail process at here. So the noise is gradually added to the input image and after the noise is denoised uh, and, and then we can get the high resolution image that here. And this is another example for generating 512 resolutions. And we used this 64 resolution input image. So this low resolution is upsampled to the target resolution for, for 512 resolutions. And with using these 2000 iterations, we got this result, result image. And actually it is not that great compared to the ground truth, but still we can see the eyebrow hair detailed and the ground uh, at the background the textures and as the smile muscles as here. And for this for this task, it took 10 minutes and five seconds. So these are the strengths of the SR3. And this, uh, this research is a novel application of diffusion models to super resolution conditional image generations. And this model can magnify the generation up to 10,024 resolutions. But the prior work, such as autoregressive model and the normalizing flows, they only can generate up to 256. So, yeah. And this model can generate, uh, this model can choose the flexible number of diffusion steps. So it enables the efficient inference. And SR3 can generate the realistic and the consistent face uh, super resolution images. And this this achieved of 50% of the full rate. And this research is becomes the foundational for later cascaded on conditional high resolution image synthesis. But this model has some limitations as well. And as you can see here, uh, in some cases, SR3 failed to recover some text and objects clearly compared to the reference images. 
And there is another limitations here. Uh, when, when the authors, they try to increase the resolution beyond the 1024, they found that images are start to getting uh, less sharp. So they found that diffusion rates drop down to the same of the previous techniques. But still, this is a great, amazing steps for the ba learning based algorithm in just one paper. And as this SR3 is a few years old research paper, so there are many subsequent papers for these SR3 models. So it may be difficult to use the SR3 di directly to the current research, but still it is a meaningful research because this is the first approach to propose the outstanding method to the super resolution task. So this is the end of our, end of our presentation. Thank you for listening.